Keurig is a company that has completely shaken up the coffee industry. They are known for being the originators and sellers of the famous K-Cup. I mean truly, this is some futuristic stuff that you would expect to see in the Jetsons, getting your coffee from a pod. Here's a visual that comes straight from the company about how it works and it's simple enough. When you put the K-Cup in the Keurig machine, it forces hot water through the lid into the coffee and the filter that already contained within the cup and then your coffee comes out the bottom into your mug. That whole system would almost have to be counted among the most widely used inventions of the past few decades. Estimates reported by the company claim that it is used by 36 million U.S. households, meaning more than one in four people in the country have this in their home. Along their path of becoming one of the biggest names in the industry, Keurig has overcome some sizable obstacles, any of which could have been potentially devastating. So in this video, I want to talk about how this unique brand grew so large while stopping to highlight three of their biggest struggles along the way. The main inventor of the whole K-Cup system and the founder of the Keurig company company is John Sylvan, and given how popular it's all become, you would expect it to be the best thing that's ever happened to him, but unfortunately, I would describe his entire involvement as being unbelievably disappointing. So much so that I'm going to put his entire experience during the early days of Keurig as the first struggle on my list. I think it's amazing that this company ever even got off the ground. Throughout the 1980s, he spent his career working in an office as a marketing manager for a semiconductor company. I'm sure, like many others across the globe, he had complaints about the coffee that was available in that office. The main complaints being that it was too strong or too weak depending on who made it, it would get old by sitting there all day, it was not customizable and that everybody was forced to drink the same kind. So he had the idea that all those problems would be solved if each person could make their own cups on demand. Essentially the idea was to make something like the K-Cups that we know today, but turning that idea into a reality proved to be difficult. He quit his job, teamed up with his old college roommate, and in 1992, before they ever had a market product, they started a company called Keurig, which I guess is derived from the Dutch word for excellence. In the beginning, the operation was as small as you could imagine, conducting experiments out of his condo, mostly using personal savings. There were issues concerning which materials would keep out the oxygen and moisture, how to seal the cups, how to best conduct the brewing process. It was literally years of experimentation trying to invent a working product. At one point, I thought this was interesting, John Sylvan had to go to the emergency room. He was having symptoms that made the doctors believe that he may have been having a heart attack or some kind of brain issue. Well, the diagnosis turned out to be caffeine poisoning because he claimed to have been taste testing 30 to 40 cups of coffee per day. So I guess that shows his dedication. After a couple of years, they ran out of money but were able to continue once they found some investors that believed in the potential of what they were doing. That arrangement, however, proved to be trouble because Sylvan didn't agree with some of their requests and just overall didn't get along with them. It got to a point where in 1997, he left the company entirely and sold them his remaining share of it for about $50,000. Now, I would assume that he would have invested more than that into the company over the previous five years, but even if somehow he didn't, selling a major share of Keurig in 1997, one year before they put out their first product, would obviously turn out to be a terrible move. So just to summarize John Sylvan's experience here, he gave up his career, invested all of his money, and spent five years working non-stop to develop the product, even had health complications from it, and then walked away from it likely at a loss right before they started making money. It seems as though he may be a little bitter over the situation, or maybe he truly doesn't believe in the invention anymore because he has since made some negative comments about it. He said, I feel bad sometimes that I ever did it. He also said, it's like a cigarette for coffee, a single serve delivery mechanism for an addictive substance. And finally, I don't have one, they're kind of expensive to use. He does have a point there. Almost any study that I could find shows that using the K-Cups tends to cost at least twice as much as the traditional method. That's kind of been their approach. The machine itself is cheap enough, but then they know that you'll have to keep rebuying the K-Cup, so that's where they make the real money. But of course, many people are willing to spend that money because they're basically paying for the convenience. But yeah, overall, it's hard to argue that Keurig struggled in the beginning, and it was an overall negative experience for founder John Sylvan. Soon after he left, in 1998, Keurig sold their first ever product, called the B2000. It was a sturdy $900 machine 
machine that had to be professionally connected to a water supply, but it was intended for commercial use only. John Sylvan had envisioned a machine that would be used in an office setting, and that's what this was. The plan was to make money by selling the machine and then partner with various coffee roasters to make the K-Cups. For example, the first company they ever did this with was called Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Keurig would allow them to make the coffee in those K-Cups as long as they paid a royalty for each of those cups that they sold. And that's how they functioned for the next five years or so, growing by selling the machines to more offices and by licensing more coffee roasters to make those K-Cups. In 2003, they released their first machine intended to be used at home. It was called the B100 and it cost $250, a little pricey and only available on the internet, but over the next few years, they released new models at lower prices that were widely available at retailers across the country. The next big move occurred in 2006, when the Keurig company was bought by none other than Green Mountain. They were the coffee roasters already responsible for over half of all K-Cup sales, so the combination just made sense. Green Mountain had actually already owned 35% of the company that they had accumulated over the past decade, so here they spent about $100 million to buy the remaining 65%. Soon after, their popularity started exploding. Just by looking at their sales, we could see that this is when many consumers across the country were first learning about the name Keurig. And oh, holy cow, looking at the stock price, I think this is probably where you should have been investing your money. But maybe not by 2012. See, that year, they had another sizable setback. The second struggle on my list is their patent expiring, because think about it for a minute. John Sylvan and the Keurig company were legally considered to be the inventors of that new system, so they held a patent that said no one could copy it. They essentially controlled that specific market without any competition for a good 15 years. And I guess technically there's dozens of patents involved for various parts of it, but the main one expired in 2012, meaning all of a sudden all of these competitors were allowed to sell a similar product. That was a big deal. Some people were predicting that this would just about be the end of Keurig, while others believed it would have a much more limited impact. Looking back at the stock market, the investors were obviously concerned about what this might mean for them, but overall, I'd say the impact was more on the limited side. About a year later, USA Today reported that rival companies had captured about 8% of the single-serve market, which isn't good, but the overall market was still growing, so maybe not the worst thing either. Their sales growth definitely slowed down, even decreasing in 2015, but overall, they had done a good job at utilizing that head start. So many people already had a Keurig branded machine. They were the name associated with the whole single-serve concept, so the competitors did have a hard time breaking into that market. In fact, in many cases, companies found it to be smarter to work within the Keurig system. When you go to the store, how many major brands do you see selling officially licensed K-Cups? They also had a defensive move in 2014, when they introduced Keurig 2.0, a new line of machines that had a feature where it was able to detect whether the cup you put into it was officially licensed by Keurig. Effectively, a digital rights management type thing that forced the customer to use official K-Cups. Honestly, it may have just aggravated their customers more than anything else, but also kind of a smart way to lock out the competitors. The next big move was in 2015, when Keurig Green Mountain, that whole combined company, was bought by JAB Holding Company for almost $14 billion. JAB has come up on the channel before, they're involved in so many different things, but most applicable here is that they were already heavily involved in the coffee business. They were the majority owner of the brands Pete's Coffee and Caribou Coffee, here they added Keurig, and the following year, they bought Krispy Kreme. And I'm not even done yet. In 2018, they bought Dr. Pepper Snapple Group for over $18 billion, and have since combined the two together into a newly formed company called Keurig Dr. Pepper that is now partially owned by the public on the stock market. I recommend you check out my video about Dr. Pepper to fully understand the significance of that deal, but I do want to point out here that Keurig has become ridiculously valuable. The same company that was running out of money after years of experimentation in someone's condo, in the same company that as recently as 2012 had some major doubters, is now being bought for billions of dollars and then combined with another company that is also worth billions of dollars. The final struggle that I want to talk about here has been ongoing. It has to do with their environmental impact. Actually, this right here is one of the reasons that John Sylvan says he feels so bad about his invention. The last official numbers that I could find report that in 2015, they sold 10.5 billion K-cups, and I think it's safe to estimate that number to be significantly higher today. Unless they're recycled, we are talking about billions of those little cups piling up in landfills every year, which is concerning. So the big question becomes whether or not they are recyclable, and the answer isn't as straightforward as you would hope. See, back around that time, 
2014-2015, Keurig was getting a lot of public criticism about their environmental impact. There was even this viral video people were sharing where the K-Cups would literally come down and start destroying the Earth. Kind of funny, but kind of terrifying. In response to the criticism, they made a promise that all of the new K-Cups would be recyclable by the end of 2020. Well, if you go to Keurig.com slash recyclable, they have all of this stuff that talks about how they met their goal. If you peel off the lid and empty out the coffee grounds, you can recycle that little plastic cup. It talks about how they switched to number 5 plastic, which is more widely recyclable. I don't know. To me, it looks pretty convincing when I read through it, but then so many others concerned with the environment are still critical. A common concern is that it can be time consuming. You know, peeling off the lid, emptying out the contents. The whole concept is based on speed and convenience, so many of their customers aren't going to take the time and effort to do that each time, and if they don't, they will end up in a landfill anyway. Plus, there could be difficulty if you leave the smallest amount of coffee grounds in there. I guess all areas don't recycle that particular plastic in that amount and then separate it. Look, I'll admit that I don't know as much as I probably should about recycling. I encourage you to look into it for yourself, especially if you are using those K-Cups, but I just want to convey that Keurig says they are recyclable, but it's questionable as to how many are actually being recycled. So there you have it, some definite obstacles that they've had to overcome, but however you feel about Keurig, you have to admit that this is an impressive success story. Despite all these setbacks, in addition to a few misguided product lines like the Keurig Cold or the time that they teamed up with Campbell's Soup, they've been doing really well. Evidenced by the most recent figures from Keurig Dr. Pepper saying that they are making their way into more and more US households and that their overall sales have been increasing to all-time highs. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Keurig? There are plenty of negatives to the story, but then there are some good things as well, so what do you think of it overall? Also, do you own one of these machines? And if you don't, what has been keeping you away from it? Is it the price or the selection? or the environmental impact. Again, many pros and cons, so any thoughts you have about any of it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.